Well, uh, I really enjoy talking about this topic. Um, let me give you just a 30 second background. Um, I knew I wanted to be a biologist when I was in the first or second year of academy. And uh, with a very stimulating mentor that many of you probably know, Dr. Lester Harris. And uh, he really knew how to get people excited. Uh, I decided to go on into biology. I, for some reason, knew I would enjoy teaching. And so I decided to go for a master's in biology. Liked what I was doing so much, I didn't do the master's and didn't do secondary teaching. I started initially at Walla Walla College on their faculty. I was there for seven years. Then I moved to Andrews. And I was there from 1970 till 2012. That's a, that's a while. I finished up 50 years of teaching in the Adventist education. And frankly, loving every minute of it. Of all the things I've done, I found the teaching most rewarding. We are out here, we being my immediate family, my wife and me, because you guys hired my son-in-law. Uh, we came out in March, oh, well, a year and a half ago, uh, because they wanted us to come out. And my son-in-law's involved in the family practice group here. Uh, Dr. Daniel Reichert, his, his uh, wife, Lynn Reichert, is my daughter, and actually she's very well trained. If for some reason all of my kids and three of four, three of, four of my grandkids took biology at Andrews. <laughs> uh, Another reason for us being here is that Zach, my grandson, this is Dan and Lynn's son, is a third year medical student here. And his twin sister is a third year med student at the University of Southern California. There because um, her husband, new husband uh, at the end of his of college, was accepted into physics at Caltech. And so those two places are quite close together. So, uh, just a word or two about the presentation. Uh, there's a fair amount of information. I may go through data quickly, but anyway. Uh, this presentation is about doing science in a Christian environment. It is not going to, I'm not going to go into the aspect of origins, at least not in this presentation. <coughs> in the early 1980s, we had an aging faculty in biology at Andrews, and uh, they asked me to be chair in 1983, and with three or four colleagues, uh, we decided we wanted to do more with our biology program. And more meant we wanted to really, really focus on the success of our biology majors to do everything we could. And that's what this story is about. We, we became pretty successful because I, I or should say we took some metrics and sent a grant to the National Science Foundation wondering if they would want to wind, find out why our students were so successful. And we got $550,000 in three months so quick, so quickly we weren't ready to start. They, we figured I'd had in a separate church grant, so usually I have about a nine month period to get ready to spend the money. Well, they caught us flat footed. They also recommended some very important changes. And that is uh, to focus on student opinion. They connected us with the, what they said was the best group in the US, at the University of Colorado on doing these kinds of surveys, and we spent over $100,000 on the survey alone. And that we'll cover very quickly at the end of the presentation. The survey, of course, of our students was not done by us because we would have biased it, but a professional educator at Andrews uh, 
took the lead in that. And with that, let me get started. Sure. We felt we wanted to do more for our students. Not that the program we inherited was not already very student involved, but we wanted to do more. And so several of us who, as I said, we had an aging faculty, a part of it, and as they retired, we progressively made changes in the mid 80s. And uh, rather than telling you what the changes of what we came up with, I, I will show you. Uh, just in case those of you who aren't familiar with Andrews, very, very different environment than here. It's really almost a self-contained campus uh, with farmland around and the metropolis of Berrien Springs on one side. Berrien Springs is about 5,000 uh, population. Uh, I tell my friends out here that I'm used to traffic jams, which are three cars at the stoplight ahead of me. <laughs> that was nice. Anyway, the science complex was built in the 70s, and the administration built with a great deal of foresight because there's still enough space for biology. And this is the, they're, they're really three interconnected buildings. This is uh, the biology part and centered around a statue by Alan Collins uh, that says something about, uh, but I, I won't try to interpret it for you now. So we first of all, although we had a friendly group, we wanted to enhance the friendliness where students felt that biology at Andrews was their home on campus. And we did it in the following ways. Uh, invite, inviting efficient study spaces within the department. Uh, we put tables and a, a big sectional sofa, though this is more recent than back in 1983. It's, it tells you a part of what we're doing, where students could get together. All of the quiet spaces in the building uh, there were tables and chairs put in for study. So, and our students really did begin to feel like this was home. And we were thrilled about that. Uh, in addition to that, we entertained our students. We had uh, a party for all of our students. We often had 150 plus uh, biology majors and biology majors for a day uh, coming to our entertainment. We fed them at the end of the of fall semester. Uh, we then had a pizza feed at the end of spring semester. And we did special events. This is someone you probably, some of you will know. She visited our campus to uh, talk about smoking cessation, et cetera, and the science she did. And we just emphasized informal contacts. So, we did find that our students feel at home in the biology department, and that was really important. Now, I want to introduce you to the actual program, the actual biology major. Uh, we focused on it being Christian, challenging, supportive, and honest. And uh, here goes. A new biology major, usually a freshman, was immediately connected with a biology faculty member as his or her mentor. And that meant that at least at the beginning of every semester, or the end of the previous semester, they got together because the mentor had to sign off on the program. It usually meant that this we, these were the have-to meetings, but there were a number more. And getting to know biology faculty like that, and we had some wonderful biology fa faculty, those. Many of you will recognize Tom Goodwin in this particular picture. Uh, we had the kind of biology faculty who really cared about student success and wanted to have the Christian environment support and strengthen that. So, 
That's the first thing. They, they got a mentor the minute they walked in the door. It turns out that our first course in biology, as I'll illustrate later, became very important in this program. You'll notice it's a 10 credit, 10 semester credit, meets five days a week and has a lab. In other words, this was a heavy duty course. Uh, but one, as we will see, became, uh, did become very important to their success. <clears throat> we created re resources for promoting student success, continuing involvement with a mentor. We had understanding that our faculty were open to all of the students in their classes for one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, that was just something we all agreed to do. That meant that while grants were welcomed, they weren't expected because grants just take a huge, huge, huge amount of time. And while we expected the faculty to publish, the expectations were not hard to reach. Uh, published in, in the peer-reviewed journal. Uh, we then arranged group reviews before each test typically, peer tutoring, and uh, learning groups. I'm going to take just a second to uh, talk about that. In the process, uh, student success became one, uh, one of my really big passions. I took some additional training and actually I've done I've been asked to come as a consultant to improve science programs. I've worked on church institutions around the world as well as here, and it's something I really enjoy. But you hear a lot about peer tutoring and learning groups. And if you look at the literature, one paper says it's worthless. Another paper says it works beautifully. Who's right? Well, what it turns out is when you look at the literature, and I had opportunity to get into that, as well as contribute to it, it works when the faculty are involved supporting and leading out. So a learning group can fall to pieces very quickly unless the faculty member is involved in making sure it's happening. And that's the way we, we uh, took that. The upper division courses, I will not bother enumerating at this point, but uh, let me just say, I'm going to be showing you some GPAs. They are only based on what we call, I'm calling an enriched core. That means we compared students in classes they all had to take or almost all took. To give them a GPA, we simply took the grade in each class and averaged that. This was to avoid the undue influence of the first five credit class. So a B in foundations contributed to the GPA as a, a B in uh, cell and molecular biology, even though one was five credits and one was three credits. We just wanted to see how the grade progression was going without foundations dominating that although it was very extremely important. And this, of course, it meant all of this and the faculty mentor, mentor followed our students through to graduation. At the same time, we involved typically getting started between the first and second year, uh, undergraduate research. And of many stripes and colors, uh, uh, molecular, microscopy, and outdoor. This happened to be a picture from Jim Hayward's uh, research on seagulls and the Puget Sound. And uh, we were fortunate enough if for the whole university to be able to get uh, undergraduate student scholarships so they could do research as compared to working in the cafeteria or doing something else. And uh, that has really helped a lot. Uh, maybe I should have uh, I should have said a little bit more about my background. Uh, it just d dawned on me. Uh, I taught until 2012. But uh, I actually, in 2000, was asked to be the dean of research for the university. And I had a decade of trying to pull all of this together. 
improve it and it seemed to have worked and the program continues to go quite well. Uh, so research is a very important part of the student's experience. Uh, it's not required. A student could go through taking some research related courses, but uh, they didn't have to do research. Many of these students did it as part of their honors program, which was a very effective program at Andrews. So this really weaves into all of that. Now, we're going to look at how things get started. Uh, pardon me, I was a slide ahead. We're going to look at the success we've been experiencing as this program developed. And the data I'm showing you are over a 10 year period of about 1993 to 2003. And uh, during that time, we had 319 students over this 10 year period who, s who said they were going to be biology majors and took foundations of biology. And I'm you calling that FB. Of those 319, we graduated 234. And that's a, that's a percentage of 73%. The national average, according to the National Academy of Sciences, is 38%. So we see a dramatic difference in the student's ability to complete the program. And uh, I won't say a lot more about that, except there is another piece to this. We had some students who would transfer in, of course, after the first course, so they missed our first year. And I would say they not only missed foundations of biology, they, f they missed what we thought was a crucial first year experience where they learned to know in the first year especially that we were there for them. We'd be thrilled as we saw them change from as their success increased. Interestingly, uh, these would start with this second year, which I'm, I'm abbreviating. This is, and the abbreviations are explained here. Genetic cell and molecular biology in, encompass the required second year of our program, two semesters. Uh, we had 54 who started then during this time period of which 34 graduated, 63%. So it's interesting that we graduated a higher percentage of the ones who started as freshmen than those who had already been through that elsewhere and started with the second year with us. Now actually I don't have the statistics here but obviously the student who starts with foundations of biology is going to take the second year course. And that's again the genetic cell microbiology. If we compare that group who took foundations first with the group who came in and started with genetic cell and molecular biology, uh, we had about 90 percent of those of our students who took foundations of biology, 90% of those who started the second year graduated. So comparing directly, we had substantially higher graduation rates if they had had the first year than if they came in without the first year, following, following the genetic cell and molecular biology. So I'm just pointing that out right, right there. Uh, the percentages, uh, that summarizes it. Incidentally, if you have questions for clarification, feel free to ask. Uh, in terms of discussion, I'd rather wait till the end. Okay, so we thought things were looking quite good. And we had, in, uh, we knew we had these statistics uh, early on and so that's when we decided to see if National Science Foundation was interested. And as I told you, they were. And they helped us bring off uh, the rest of the program. Now, the rest of the program, uh, in many ways, is kind of typical lecture, although kind of informal, a bit more informal than you can be with 500 students out there and you're 
tied then to a very, very rigid and, and totally pre-planned program. Uh, I've been up close and personal with that. I won't take time, time to tell you how and why, but our success following the first year is just so much farther ahead than the really good large universities who start the first year without where the students have to really look for support and help. Looking for that golden moment or the progress that we call educational transformation, which is now a buzzword in, in education, simply meaning success improves after the first year or during the first year. So lectures are frequently informal, labs in all classes, uh, the students work in pairs in most of the classes. This happens to be one of my classes. Uh, and there is always help in the lab. And many of you are familiar with what labs are like. I would like to just emphasize number five. Our faculty were expected to be around and in and out at least during all of their labs, even multiple sections if possible. Sometimes it wasn't. So the faculty don't just, didn't just turn things over to a student, etc. So uh, this kind of help seemed to make a real difference. Uh, their lab reports do, we're, we're, we're pretty hard nosed. A student could not leave lab until they showed they had done the required work or something had developed where they couldn't be expected to finish. Uh, if they walk out the door without that, it's a negative. So they clear that they're done, they can ask questions, and then they write lab reports. And then we often, we go over the lab reports afterwards with them as they have questions. Uh, this happens again in our class of informal group that gathered outside the lab, which is over here, to uh, understand what they didn't understand about a particular lab. We tried to focus on labs that would, it, that would contribute to enhancing the understanding of the whole discipline. Uh, met, many of them were not trivial and sometimes took a lot of effort to finish. Okay, I want to go back to foundations of biology. Uh, I personally had a very pleasant surprise in putting this together. Oh, I need to, sorry, I got in a hurry at the beginning. Let me insert parenthetically. Uh, I was largely responsible for writing the grant, but I had enough other things going that I did not ask for personal support in the grant. Uh, I asked for two colleagues who did a, an excellent job. One who looked at academic success and the other took this massive uh, task of interviewing. Uh, incidentally, we have 1,100 pages of transcribed uh, con uh, transcri uh, conversations with these graduates, which were then uh, evaluated very, very professionally using the best advice we could get. As I mentioned, this group from the University of Colorado were very intimately involved in how we did it. So anyway, uh, one of the surprises for me, not totally, was how important foundations of biology, and I'm going to say now immediately, and the first year experience were. Uh, what I have here, and this is the, the most complicated graph I'll show you. Basically, we start off with 234 students who took foundations of biology. These are their grades. 90 got A's, 42 got A minuses, 30 got B pluses, etc. Then we took each of these grade groups and calculated their, their GPA in each of the required classes. Like the second semester of foundations of biology, the genetics, uh, first of the second year, cell and molecular biology, second year, ecology, historical and philosophical biology, systems physiology, histology. Let me point out the two courses that are in here that are not actually required 
by the core are the system of physiology and histology. But since the overwhelming majority of our students took them, and they were more the more difficult courses, they're included in this analysis. So here's the way it goes. Uh, this group who got C's, their average put them up to a B minus on foundations two, following this line over, uh, C plus in genetic cell and molecular biology one, two. Do you get the idea? In other words, each of these colored lines is this cohort followed through these different courses. These, uh, these uh, numbers at the end are the mean GPA for that cohort. So uh, the group that got an A in found, foundations of biology dying to them ended up with an average core GPA of 3.6. So that's what this shows. Uh, and it's really amazed us at first to see how the grades they got in the more advanced courses were highly correlated with their success in foundations of biology. And that success was promoted by uh, the interaction with faculty, et cetera. So what's very interesting to me, and I didn't expect this, in the mean core GPA, these are for the ones who are graduating, the, the GPAs were separated, separated out into two groups, pretty much, a high group and a lower group. Now, the, the overwhelming number of students were in the higher groups because they would have a Roughly 160 would have been in this area. It's unexpected to see them uh, separate out this way, but they did. But something else happened th that became apparent. We knew, we, we knew it was happening experientially, but very pleased to see this trend in the students who weren't the top students. Notice the trend in GPA in the more advanced courses. Uh, this increased success is a definition of the, as I said, the educational buzzword now, educational transformation. And we believe that it is this increasing success that ends up with so many of our majors being successful and getting into what they wanted to do for their life. And I'll, I'll follow along with that. So uh, we found that not only for this group, but for the group that started off with B plus. And for us, this is pleasing. Uh, I didn't say at the beginning, uh, we purposefully followed Andrews University it, uh, uh, entrance requirements. In other words, we didn't go out and try to get a select group of students to take a biology major. We, in fact, wanted to work with students and help them improve. Uh, forgive me for putting it that way, but uh, we as a group agreed that diamonds in, diamonds out isn't really a big educational challenge. What is the challenge is to take the students who are struggling at first, see them become adept at doing a land analytical and thoughtful analysis, and see their success go up. And that's really what you see there. Notice that it's most obvious when the students start out low, which this is the group, if I could say in, in a way that I'm understood appropriately, we were most interested in. We knew our good students would stay good. And believe me, they got as much attention as they wanted. They had their advisors as well, but uh, they were just on the way. So we, in many ways, were happiest for this type of an outcome. What is amazing for those of you who, uh, amazing to me, who are familiar with the statistics involved, the, the correlation coefficient between the foundations of biology grade and the mean core GPA at the end is 
Now, if you're familiar, any correlation coefficient above 0.35 to 0.4 for human data is striking. And if you follow it down further, it means that this first grade would explain over 60% of the variability in grades. It's the, the square of the uh, correlation coefficient is one that allows you to uh, explain some of the sources of variability. And so we believe that this correlation coefficient isn't just due to foundation, but due to that crucial first year experience where they integrated one of the most effective, let's see, I've got, there. okay, let me just divert a minute. One of the most effective things I've ever done as a teacher, and uh, I bore the results, I almost never gave anything but a discussion-based test. In a class of 40 students, that meant 10 to 15 hours of grading after every test. But what happened was, when they got the test back, they had notes on there what was wrong with that answer. And that was, for me, one of the most effective doorways. Come back in, let's talk about it. And then you can say, look, you missed this, but you got that right. Now let's look at the future. If, you're, if you learn to be more analytical and dig into the underlying, you're gonna do better. And it just, frankly, it happened over and over again to see this change, which we document here. And our whole faculty, it was, it was a, a point of agreement that we would do it this way. And by the way, that to us is a Christian environment which nurtures and treasures these wonderful young people we had a, the joy of working with. So anyway, educational transformation was, we think, very, very important in our program. Now, there's a lot of information here I'm just gonna go through very quickly. Uh, one of the things that may surprise you is that, let me give the negative first. SAT scores mean nothing in terms of student success. Uh, I can say more, but they, if I plot the SAT scores of our students and their grades, it's a flat line. The SAT scores do not follow the grades, except I should be a little more open. The very top students, the ones who are in the top five to 10% of SAT or ACT scores, they had a better correlation with the grades. The rest, it, it was meaningless. And this is now nationally accepted, and I'll show you a little bit more on that later on. The most predictive metric our students enter with is their high school GPA. Now, the common talk in the literature said, ha, high school GPA, you got good high, high school, bad high schools, it's meaningless. Well, it's just the reverse. In spite of that, the correlations are greatest with high school GPA. And so we have put our majors uh, in this graph, and each dot is a student. And here, these are the N's, and you'll see that this would be four, three point, uh, 3.9, 3.8, 3.7, 3.6, et cetera. Uh, these are the means for each of those group, and this is a regression fitted line. And so clearly uh, the student's high school GPA was important in our program as well. We hoped that we could help them overcome th that prediction and raise their success. Uh, let me fly quickly through some, uh, some other things here. 94% of our students had a, came into a high school GPA above three. That would be that part of the, of the graph. Uh, and again, we're looking at core GPA over here. 75% um, of the students had core GPAs of three or higher all the way through. Uh, 70% had core GPAs that were above about 3.2 to 3.3. And in our experience, 
that is a predictive point. If a student is below a 3-2 or a 3-3, their chances of getting uh, into future training go down substantially. That's just the, for us a rule of thumb, as we, we knew our students very well. So these are the 70% of these students in our program, as these, as these grades sh show, uh, actually had a reasonable likelihood of being able to get into med school or graduate school or some other health or life science related discipline that was post college. And I just said that uh, students with the core GPA of 3.2 to 3.3, you might say simply have a future. Okay. As a result, we found that the students entering, and I'm looking at this box right here, with a high school GPA of 3.6 or higher, were very likely to do well enough in the program to go on for what they wanted to do. But again, it was these that we wanted to get pulled up there that were, our, our, we especially enjoyed that. Now, why am I showing you this? This graph right here is borrowed, obviously. It has the cumulative GPA of 80,000 college graduates. This study was commissioned by a college and university admissions officers because the dots are those who reported an SAT score and those who didn't, for which they knew nothing about. And th the correlation is with high school GPA in terms of their cumulative GPA. The SAT score had almost no impact as this graph shows. And these are college admissions officers doing that. I'm using this for another purpose, and that is I want to compare the core GPAs of our graduates with these cumulative GPAs nationally. And so here goes. That's a reasonably well-fitted line to the national data. These are the mean core GPAs of each of our groups that I showed you before. A fitted line to that looks like this, substantially above the cumulative GPAs of these college graduates. Incidentally, the universities involved in this were included very good schools. They weren't just the, the poor bottom. So anyway, to go on quickly, if we do this, our graduates had on average a 0.4 GPA unit increase over the cumulative GPAs of these other students. I couldn't get biology GPAs to compare, but I will tell you that our group of students involved in these averages had cumulative GPAs that were on average 0.2 GPA units above their core GPA, which is not terribly surprising. So, Making, whoops, making a uh, comparison nationally, our students plot out to be ahead, is what I wanted to say. During this time, uh, this is the change. We started this program here. This is the change in number of biology majors over this time period which is pretty substantial. Uh, there are two waymarks that I want to point out. First of all, the so-called biomedical option. Uh, while this may not seem like very much to you, but it was a crucial decision on our part because within the field of biology generally, there are so many courses that would be really relevant to being prepared for medical school. Now, biologists are so pure at heart often, and this is why it was a struggle for us, we don't want them to get out without a botany course and without a field biology course. And we struggled for a year or two saying, okay, what's more important to us? Serving students who want to go down a human health track, 
uh, especially medicine, or turning out the kinds of biologists that uh, we cherish. And we came to a difficult conclusion that we wanted to focus on the student. And the students could enrich the program or vary it a little or what have you. But anyway, uh, th thus, this for us was an important way mark because this is where we as a faculty uh, agreed to create a biomedical option. And this had very much to do with increased enrollment. Uh, we have never been, as a group, unhappy with making that decision because it's student focused. Now, Here's the, year, whoops, here's the year we got the NSF grant. Of course, Andrews made a big deal out of that, and I would say reasonably so, but notice the change in slope and increase enrollment from that to this. So when that word got out, it brought in more students. So right now, the en enrollment of biology majors is right around 150. Uh, actually, this this went so high that it made it more and more difficult to, to meet the individual student's needs. So we kept going. Now, I do want to finish up quickly here. Uh, our graduates were more ethnically diverse than the national. This is from the uh, National Academy of Sciences for 2001, 68% Caucasian, uh, 12% Asian, 8% Black, 5% uh, Hispanic. Here's the Andrews over this time period. 51% Caucasian, 28% Asian, 15%. You'll, you'll notice the minority representative is, is substantially higher. And these minorities, at least the Hispanic and uh, black minorities are really underrepresented in science. So uh, we were very happy to see this happening, that uh, groups, uh, ethnic groups that are underrepresented in US science uh, make up a substantially larger proportion of graduating AU biology majors. Now, actually, I'm going back to the graphic I showed you a little while ago for just one purpose. We then ran the average uh, scores for our three main ethnic groups. So if we separate out the Caucasian group, there's the regression line. Slightly better than average uh, for the whole group. The next, for the black, it's very close. In other words, we wanted to we hoped that we would see that the ethnicity of a student was not determinative in their success. Rather, it was their preparation, regardless of their ethnicity, that they walked in with. And anyone who's done statistics on these slopes knows there's not going to be a significant difference between those three slopes. Uh, we didn't have enough Hispanics to include them here, but you can see the, the regression lines for for the, their mean core GP when I graduated are basically indistinguishable. And that's very important to us, that we were serving our whole group, not just, say, just the Caucasians. So, I've given you that take home message. Now, this is a question that we face all, have to answer all the time. Are these high success rates simply the results of having an easy, quotes, pushover program? Or do they represent real, uh, really important outcomes? The major field test many of you may not be familiar with, but it's a test given in the senior year uh, to many graduates in many different institutions and they compare the group. Obviously, each individual student gets a, a percentile score is how they campaign. Uh, there are about 20,000 students who take the biology test every year. And uh, they 
maybe I better better get the da the, the data on board without trying to describe it by waving my finger in the air. So obviously, since this is a group by group percentile score, the mean as percentile for the whole study has to be 50 percentile. Uh, over this period of, th of this study, there are two measures I'm showing you. The composite score, the, the major field test is, can be subdivided into subgroups like molecular biology, uh, ecology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but the composite score that our students had over this time period was typically 90 percentile or above, ending up with a mean over that period of time of 88.1 per percentile. In many ways, we were even more happy about the so-called analytical score, which looked at the results on qu questions on the test that were evaluating whether or not the student understood and could apply information. And we found that that was very high. And that's a little bit more difficult to uh, obtain in a biology program versus physics, for example, because uh, memorization can get you through a fair amount of biology, but it doesn't help much in physics. So uh, we're very happy to see that that high. So it, yes? You have the uh, composite and the analytical. What, what other? Oh, their subscores, ecology, uh, cell biology, molecular biology, uh, kind of field biology, and I'm not remembering them all right now since I haven't looked at these, the individual scores carefully since I yeah. was no longer chair in 2000. But analytical is roughly one-sixth of the, a, of the grade or of the, uh, the measurement? Yes, one-seventh, one-eighth, something like that. I, it's just, it's, though, it's, okay, I get where you're coming from. Uh, the other scores, if you look at them individually, substantiate this high composite score. I think that's what you were asking. Okay, so we kind of passed that test, we thought. Here's the 10-year average for acceptance of those who applied into med school, 85%. The uh, generally, though there may be those who are better informed than I am in this environment, generally nationally about 45% of those who apply get in. But we've consistently been above 80% year after year after year. So it looks as our, our graduates do pretty well in a competitive environment. And for those who apply for graduate programs, uh, it's a little easier for us to follow, but that's 90% or better who apply get in. So their backgrounds are being valued by advanced training programs. And that, of course, means a lot because not only are you getting a decent grade, you're ready to go, to go on. And uh, for us as a group, these were, are, were, and for the group now, are extremely rewarding outcomes, which we feel substantiate that you can do an outstanding job of education and sciences in a very Christian supportive environment. I'm going to skip this. This is an example of how you can help, you can help students improve, but we're running out of time. Here's the final slide, and it's the most important one. These are the outcomes of the survey that we did to something over 100. Uh, let me describe how it's done. And this is the way the professionals do it. You have a conversation with a, an individual who's agreed to give input. We had like 105 of these, uh, almost equally divided between current students and alumni. Uh, what they do is they, they uh, they ask a general question, how did you feel about, or what, how did the program you were in fit? And then you let them talk. 
and they, could, they may talk for a half an hour saying what they want, or it could be shorter, but the, the person interviewing, and I might, I guess it should go without uh, needing to say, we in biology got nowhere near this, because if our students had any idea that we were part of it, it would have it's been shown that that can skew the outcome. So this was done professionally by our education department. NSF gave us an additional $50,000 to do this, and we spent about a, a little over $100,000 on supporting the, the whole interview process. So while a lot of these terms appear to be redundant, they're there because students use those, uh, referred to those topics in the interview. Then uh, the tra inter trained interviewer, if the individual did not include important parts, would go back and ask questions like, well, how, how did you feel about this? Or how did you feel about that? And what we found extremely rewarding was that their top, the top information, including our minority groups, African American, the list on the side tells you the makeup of students in those interview groups, that they all agree. You can, you can see the different subgroups. I won't go through them, but this is what they're telling the interviewer about the factors that they thought that made them most successful. And you can see, uh, I, I don't know that it's necessary to go th uh, through these, but uh, fostering student-focused ethos, in other words, whole behavioral environment, down to personal attention across all groups, even those who we worried might not appreciate it as much. Some of the, they're all there. <coughs> this is the most important outcome, and there's a great deal more information that is still being dug into. Let me just say parenthetically, the two principals who were, who's, were supported by the grant but for their summers, et cetera, to do the work, as they got to the end of pulling the data together, both uh, became long-term ill, debilitating illnesses. And they are just now recovering enough, a number of years later, that we are going to be publishing this, we think, within the next 12 months. Even though the data are old, they're extremely relevant. I have taken the lead. I'm retired, and I have felt not only an interest as a longtime chair in part of this and fascinated with, with effective teaching, but also uh, <laughs> oh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I just simply felt the responsibility to see this through the end. So frankly, I've spent hundreds of hours on that since we moved out here a year and a half ago, uh, going back through data provided by our admissions office, et cetera, student by student, course by course. So I'm fairly secure that these data are accurate. We just had something very interesting happen. My son sent me an email literally three days ago referring me to the Wall Street Journal story. Colleges where students feel most engaged. Religious affiliation. Eight out of the top 12 students in this Wall Street Journal survey would have been like Andrews or La Sierra or Wall of Wall, have you, you know, smaller, student-focused, religiously centered. That's pretty impressive. Interestingly, Caltech was about number 500. In other words, they give the student a very demanding environment, but do little to help the undergraduate. I, I won't take the time now, but I've been down this road because 
One of my master's students, who's now has a PhD, uh, we stayed in contact, he's at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Physiology and Neuroscience. And he wanted uh, to do a study number two at the University of Connecticut. And we spent a couple of years working with developing a grant and found out that, well, I won't go into the details, politics uh, got in the way and the university would not send our grant on to NSF for a collaborative. But I looked up close at, and saw what was going on. And if you could get through the first year and into their department, the second year where they started getting to know the students and their success improved, but probably there fewer than, say, 10% of the students who said they wanted to go into neuroscience ended up as neuroscience students the second year. So it is a very big difference. Now, I do want to do something else here. I'm Ashley Reichert. My name is Zach Reichert. My name is Sumika Weir. And I'm a biology major studying pre-med at Andrews University. And I'm also in the JN Andrews Honors Program. Andrews does a really great job of making sure that you have all of the material that you need to be prepared. So there's a large volume of information that you need to have. And they do an excellent job of passing that bulk of information on to you, but at the same time, you can't go into your MCAT and do great if you just have the information. There's a high level of critical reasoning. The main thing that translates into MCAT success is the amount of effort and planning that you put into it. Being at Andrews, especially being in uh, both the biology program and the honors program, it really helped me develop ways of thinking. The professors are super open to, to getting to know you and to helping you succeed and find opportunities. I think interactions with professors here have really been what's stimulated and driven curiosity. The professors in the biology program here at Andrews were, I think, one of my favorite things about my time at Andrews. And so it was a really neat experience. The honors program, for one, really helped because it, it helped me get into contact with a group of different students, not only who were in the biology program, but in other majors as well, who were all really interested in learning. There was a program called the Honors Buddy Program where they would pair incoming freshmen up with seniors. And I was paired with a guy who actually became a really good friend. He's still a really good friend today. I would absolutely recommend doing pre-med at Andrews University. I would recommend studying honors at Andrews University. I absolutely recommend studying biology at Andrews. In the interest of full disclosure, I don't know if you got that at the beginning, these were three of our biology majors that scored 199th and two 100th percentiles on the MCAT uh, all in one year. And at the interest of full disclosure, the two Reicherts are my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm proud. That's it. Um, can you pass the mic back? <clears throat> um, from, from your figure about the importance of the foundational first year and how well the students did in that, which essentially determined how well they're going to do later on, has anybody considered um, mm, how should I say, encouraging some of the weaker students in that cohort of the found in the first year of repeating the first year of biology in order to give them a better foundation for what follows so that they would be able to do better? 
Subsequently, if if that was done, was there any outcome well, that would uh, let, follow? Let, let me answer this way. We chose not to, that holding the student up, because we were finding that we could, the students who got through foundations with less than a B were the ones we, we, we knew their results and we really focused in on them in the second year. And later, and you saw the GPAs coming up. And our experience by then had told us that improvement in our program, particularly at Loma Linda, which knew our program, improvement in that program was enough to get a student in, even though their GPA was a little bit low. Yeah, but they remain near the bottom of the class throughout. Well, if you want to say that a GPA of 3.4 at the end is bottom, well, that's not typical in science. That, so yes. Those well, who were in the C's to begin with ended up less than 3.0 at the end. Well, there are many who didn't, who were above. Happy to hear it. I, I'm just wondering if perhaps, um, well, this is one of the problems that I've personally struggled with many of the students coming here uh, in the graduate program, those who come in with weak backgrounds. I would personally want to give them some preparatory courses before they actually come into the program, but I've almost invariably been overruled by my colleagues because they feel, oh, that would stigmatize them or something. Well, they're, no, they're, I'm they're, thinking it would give them a leg up so that they would have a better chance of understanding what's going on. You win nothing but by having I, students. I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I would probably personally not choose to ap approach the problem that way because we found improvement in tougher classes carried a separate message that got them. We still have extremely high positive results at the end. Uh, and there were a, the few students who retook foundations, because they had to, almost never pulled out, in spite of as much help and involvement. Because they were getting all of this in foundation to begin with. If, they didn't, if you didn't see their grades going up from a low C to into the B range in the first semester, uh, they got, their, their, their mentors would just honed right in on them. So by the second semester, if you noticed, the second semester foundation's grades were substantially higher. And this is one reason why. And that second semester carried a lot of them through. Yes. You scarcely said anything about the master's program, which is your graduate program at Andrews. That's and right. And as I understand it, um, it, while the end value, the number of students, I'm sure, is much smaller than your undergraduate population, that still there seems to be statistically a significantly high number of students from that program that have gone on into uh, academic positions at research universities. And I wonder if you could just say something about that, even if you haven't analyzed that data set. Yes, this, this uh, we did have a master's program during this whole time. And this was very close to my heart for reasons you know, Dave, but uh, I can mention. But uh, this is about undergraduate success. This, because this, this is really, by far our most important mission is this uh, relatively large group of students to helping them go out the door as strong Christians who understand themselves better and really begin to have confidence in their ability to not only do well academically but to serve to help and uh, <laughs> there are, you know if, th you could keep digging and digging and digging but the we did have a small master's program and I was very much involved in that. Uh, I had oh, about 39 master's students during my 40-some uh, years uh, of active in the biology program there, and very, very positive results. We had 
One year, and this, I'm giving you personal messages, mm -hmm. one year we had four, four students finish uh, some neuroscience as my students. They all interviewed at Mayo in the human molecular neurobiology area. Mm -hmm. Mayo interviewed 50 people from around the country. They flew in about 15, including about four of ours. And at the end, four out of four positions. <laughs> Pardon me. Success gets to me. Four out of four got those positions. Finished at Mayo and have just gone on to outstanding careers. And we did see that. It was another important part of it, but not the focus of, the, of this. But the master's program did one thing beautifully for the undergrads. Well, two things. One, they were serious lab TAs and they were there to help the students. And all the pictures I showed you of TAs, these were all graduate students, but they happened to be in my classes. Our undergraduate TAs are very good too, but we focus on, at Andrews on the TAs only doing it if they're willing to spend time with the students. Not always successful, but it really has paid off. So in that sense, yes, the graduate program did make positive contributions. Uh, okay, does that, all right. Yes, Jack. <clears throat> as you as you know, biology is the epicenter of evolutionary studies and evolutionary teaching. And can you say something about how your program handled this very very crucial part yeah. of? There's a of chance topic. we might come back to that question later on. I think, mm. as as Paul and I have talked, but uh, I purposely left it out today uh, for several reasons. Uh, we really wanted to focus on what being Christian really is as a, a, to us as, as faculty and as those who have been given the privilege of shaping and preparing lives. Uh, the area of origins, we agreed and hired care very carefully. Part, a part of the success was that the older faculty who were good in their own right, but they didn't share this vision. As they retired, we very purposely chose faculty who were really interested in this program that was there to help students succeed. Uh, and we got some marvelous people coming in the door. Uh, if I may digress for a minute. Uh, this was probably five or six years into my chairmanship, and we went through this as a group. Almost all of our faculty agreed we wanted to go this way. Not quite everybody. We had uh, some people who were very, very good in environmental biology who still wanted to keep the program in that area, but by and large, when we decided on the biomedical option, the, the die was kind of cast where, it was, where we were focusing. Anyway. Uh, we had an opening come, uh, and we had two candidates. Uh, one of the other beauties of our program was that our biology program had gained enough reputation that we could attract three or four interviewees who would, be, would have been good choices for every position. And. Uh, in one position, two people, and I'll, I'll mention some names, Tom Goodman and Robert Zador were both candidates. Tom was already in his first three or four years of faculty out here in the Earth, Earth and Geological Sciences program. Uh, Rob was right out of graduate school. They, in their own ways, were, would have been really incredible catches. Tom looked at it and said, I think I want to stick, stick around, but kind of whispered in my ear. We said, don't forget about me. So we got Rob. Three or four years later, we got Tom. Had we done it the other way around, Rob would have been gone. They have been at the center of blessing in this program. Does God play a role? <clears throat> We felt he, that he did. Now, does that answer? 
No. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Uh, sorry. You I, see, sorry, uh, you, you got me off into a track. Uh, we, uh, one of the, yeah, I got into interviewing faculty on that. Thank you for bringing me back, George. Uh, George's mm -hmm. office was just down the hall uh, in, uh, in chemistry, so. Uh, and we, we, we knew I was there. green with envy that we, you had a graduate program. Green with envy. I had a few of your students. It, it was, uh, it was a, a very special joy. But uh, <clears throat> we hired faculty intentionally with those who supported the Genesis story of creation. We did not go into how many years since, cre since creation, uh, you know, that where you had to have definite positions there, but we wanted a faculty that saw creation as a result of divine activity, ending up with real organisms rather than encouraging slow change. And so uh, that was an important part, but we didn't try to create 100% agreement. Jim. Frankly, with my years involved in Briscoe, uh, pardon me, Ariel, but uh, you may agree with this, uh, we developed a mantra, when we all agree in origins, we can be sure of one thing, we're all wrong. Jack, um, just, just yes. a slight follow-up. If you pick up any biology textbook, you will you will immediately be confronted with this issue. And so what I was <clears throat> primarily interested in to see is, as a teacher, how do you, <clears throat> how do you um, <clears throat> convey to the students that the information in the textbooks are basically good and acceptable and, and you should study it, but at the same time present your take on the, on the evolutionary uh, slant well, of all the material. It's a, it's a tremendous sure. challenge. Yes, <clears throat> but there's, there's one plus in there being so overt, we found. And that is when they gave in the introduction a clear indication, either a direct statement or saying it in a way you couldn't misunderstand it, that they were starting off with the assumption of philosophical naturalism. There's no, there's no further discussion. They can't go down any other pathway. And when we point that out, our most effective, I don't want to say counter, but our most effective approach was to emphasize design over and over and over again as being much more effective than getting involved in in a lot of the stuff that you 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 can't you can't play with it you can only measure it and so we tried to focus very strongly on design and i still feel of all the options we have available to us design is most convincing Uh, just a comment, uh, uh, congratulations on your work here, that is admirable. Thank you. Uh, I was chairman of that department 60 years ago, and we did nothing like what you've done. And I yeah, want to I, congratulate you on that. I'm very well aware of what you were facing too, Ariel, so, yeah. but I just didn't want to leave uh, that behind. Uh, and uh, we used to have high scores. We knew our students were doing well and so on, but we had no organized program like this. Mm -hmm. We had some interest in the students, but uh, sure. th th this was, uh, this is a, a prime uh, example of what you can do if you uh, get behind something. Uh, the one question I have here about your data, and. Man, these, these high scores on these national tests and so on, you know, 90% dial and so on. This is, this is, you can't argue with that. Thank uh, you. Uh, and we had good scores then too that you couldn't argue with, but I don't think they were quite that good. Uh, the, uh, the, the question I worry about a little bit is, uh, 
Uh, as you know, there's been a, uh, a gradual progression of granting better and better grades over the years. Uh, a C was an average grade when I was in college, now it's more a B is more or less the, the situation. Uh, and upper division courses tended to have higher grades than lower division courses on an average. Uh, can you protect your data against that trend or can you account for the trend or can you correct for the trend? Uh, it's just a question that well, you have about some of the, one some thing, of the data. One thing we did during my chairmanship and, and others have done as well was to plot out scores in each class and see if we we're seeing that great inflation. And generally we weren't. By, by, we tried to stay really yeah. solid and hard. Uh, I'll give you a personal example. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't want you to misunderstand. But when kids took my systems physiology, which was a junior senior class, they'd tell me, this is the most difficult biology class offered. Then they'd follow up, but I love it. And that was thrilling. Uh, and we, we kept track of how, where our grades were and the success of the students once they left. So we, th I, we think we avoided the grade inflation. I know in my classes there wasn't a grade inflation. But that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, a comment? Um, I think the issue of grade inflation may come in other contexts. What I've observed is that students tend to titrate their effort according to what they expect will be required. Of course. <laughs> that, you know? Well, I mean, so, if, you, if you're a student, you've got to do it that way. Well, you got to put yeah, your effort where it counts know, most. And I've noticed that some students um, who are near the bottom of the class have the frame of mind that, well, all I have to do is just get by. And that's why they are near the bottom of the class. And I try to disabuse them of that attitude, but, but it's not always easy. <laughs> well, you can imagine with the mentoring program we set up, where the student has a specific mentor every semester through the whole program, which often switched. Mm -hmm. And you didn't get signed on to new courses without visiting that individual. So we would try, um, I, I had some lessons to learn. Uh, early on when I got into this, I, I was telling you, well, let's look at, look, look at your results. The way you're going, you don't have a chance. One of my best friends, who was absolutely superb in doing this, said, Jack, that's not the right way. You're no prophet. <laughs> He says, let's look at it this way. Fortunately, this was in the first couple of years of my chairmanship. Let's show the student their grade and the grades of other students yeah. who were successful yes, yes. without making individual judgments. Yeah. And that's all it took. That's amazing. That's exactly what I've been doing. I show them exactly where they sit relative to everybody else. And I say, so this is where you are now. Where would you like to be? And how can we get you there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, kind of... you do learn, if, if you stay close to this, you do learn, uh, let me use an example. Uh, a student I became very close to, a black student, who was obviously talented, and just kind of, nah, well, you know, enjoy life. Somehow he caught fire, and, and this is a personal example, uh, in my physiology class top student in the class from a, a 2.7 or 2.8 previous GPA. He did a master's with me. Uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of research in Europe with colleagues, and I won't go into how all that worked out, but he went over there for two summers to do much of his, and this was neurobiology, which was difficult stuff to do. And when he 
after the end of the second year, uh, I had a, a very dear friend who, well, two very dear friends who were in this program. It was the University of Göttingen in Germany, which is one of the top science universities. Anyway, when he finished, when after the end of his second year, we knew he had enough for a thesis. Uh, the faculty who had gotten to know him said, look, stay here, do a little bit more, and we'll give you a doctorate. <coughs> That was a huge change. This guy had ability coming out all over the place. But he learned to focus. And those, those are just absolutely thrilling stories for us. Yeah, Jack, it's nice to get an inside view of your program at Andrews. I was there for many of the years that you were there, yes. but had only an outside view as a non uh, scientific major and working in the library there. Uh, now I have the added dimension of viewing students' success through the eyes of my wife, Loretta. She had the privilege, as you know, to work very closely with you when you were dean. Yes. And she was assistant dean, and you spent a lot of time and effort, I know, on student success for struggling students. And so Loretta's worked out here for about 10 years and now retired. But um, one, one thing that um, I hear her saying quite often in medical education is that so many of the students have parents who have been graduates either of Loma Linda or have been doctors, have been professionals. And that kind of primes them for wanting to succeed on that basis. Have you done any uh, family background studies? Are there probably a percentage of students that parents never w finish college and they, the students come along and they succeed in the program? Is there, are there any statistics on family background? In, in the general of, literature, yes. Yeah, I'm sure there We did be. not choose to, yeah. to d quote, dig there. Although with our mentoring program, uh, I got to know family background for a number of my mm. mentees, as well as the others did. We just didn't let that sort of thing rest. And the most heartbreaking situation we saw over and over again was the family, and I'm, well, this is a medical environment, family who satisfied with nothing but medicine, and the student wants to be a musician. I mean, we, we, I mean, that brings on counseling that's crucially important. And you would like to think that the family would put the welfare, but it's just so very, very important. And that's probably the most difficult part for us to get involved advising-wise. You can't exactly fight the family, even though you know they're the cause of tremendous emotional trauma. We see it here at Loma Linda, and it's oh, just, of course these are do. not just isolated cases. Of course either. you do. Am I correct in understanding that you, as a department, developed this evaluation program? And if that's correct, does the university also have an assessment program that's layered on top of that, that you have to meet their assessment programs for the university as a whole? Or is this your? Assessment program. Well, let me say we were way ahead of the curve. Uh, the whole evaluation of uh, education at college level has become assessment driven, uh, sometimes to its detriment and sometimes to its advantage. Uh, I've particularly seen within the church. Uh, a part of what I did, I did I've done a lot of, of assessing in Adventist programs in other parts of the world, as well as uh, programs in this country, and I've been hired individually by several programs to give them advice, and evaluate their program, give them advice. So I'm kind of well aware of what role assessment can play. But some assessors don't ask the right questions. It seems to me that assessment might be more successful if it was program specific than university overlaid. Because what you've demonstrated is how successful it can be when the faculty 
and the students are working together to make it a success mm -hmm. versus the university saying, here are the goals that you will meet, now how are you doing that? Yes. However, uh, I had a short term as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, which was oh, the largest <laughs> of the entities at Andrews. There are programs that just don't care about anything. Yeah. And there you've got to get in for the student's welfare. But do you think that that could still work with somebody in your position as a dean to go to the, that program and say, this program will find a way to make it work and you will become um, program specific assessment versus saying the whole university is evaluated the same way? I, I, would, I would say two things in response. Secondly, if you're in an administrative position and you don't understand that program inside and out, stay away. But they should be able to sit down together and do what you did as faculty in that department and come up with something that works the, for the their crucial program specific. The two words were should be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, it can be really a puzzle to f figure out how to make them want to focus on their student success. But it can also be frustrating for faculty in a department to have so much overlaid on them that is completely irrelevant to the program. And that is the most important message to take to the assessors. Because they can ask for 50 metrics, of which three or four are relevant. And if the faculty member meets all of that, Everything else goes down. They don't have time for students because they're, they're assessing how they did with students, etc. This, La this the last program I wrote for the state before I retired was 800 pages, basically of falderall, because I had to meet standards that had, were irrelevant. This is this is your classical situation of arguing over the correct hue of green for the deck chairs on Titanic. Well, there is a growing antidote to that. And that is assessment, first of all, is outcomes driven. You look at outcomes and then you start filling in the blanks. Rather than doing all of this and all of that and this is why we didn't do well here and this is why we did. You simply measure the outcomes and see how what's going. And then you find out reasons for it. And that's really important information for others. And I, I, I did a lot of things at Andrews in 43 years. For 15 years, I chaired the whole strategic planning program for the university. And you really got into what was important and what was, unfortunately, there were people who didn't want to have to follow that pathway. So, you know, one thing you find, and I guess I can say this, is at least I am an educator, a professor, trying to get a group of faculty, professors together who are each trained for, their, for the right reasons to believe that they have the best answers. Ever work with a group like that? I, 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 there's one example always sticks in my mind. We were in the middle of strategic planning trying to come up with something big. We were looking at the university budget, which was around $60 million and how it was being expended. One member of the faculty had a pet. The total expenditures were around $10,000. Could not get that person for a half an hour to be, be quiet and move away. It even got fairly directive. Okay, we talked about that. So in some groups, faculty and other people who believe in their own Ability are literally like trying to herd cats. So, yes. Jack, um, I, I'd like to try a hypothetical uh, uh, question. And I'm trying to uh, uh, reconcile what George Javor is saying and what uh, somebody behind me was just addressing. Um, if you could go back as Dean of Sciences, and you've heard George say that he was green with envy over your graduate program while being in the chemistry program. George is biochemist. Malin Kutsi was probably at that time in biophysics. Wouldn't it, 
looking backward, wouldn't it have been good to have brought in physics and chemistry by combining somehow into the biology graduate master's program a biophysics and biochemistry emphasis? Well, we, we did that informally. Okay. Uh, it, 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 there weren't enough faculty and there wasn't enough other stuff to have it a formal thing. But, but you, could get, you could get level. a master's in biology yep. with focusing on biophysics. Okay. We were willing to tailor make the programs. <laughs> Dr. Stell, you're a fearless leader. <laughs> and I, I really applaud the job you've done for the Andrews Biology Department. And my question would be, what measures have been taken to ensure the continuation of this program in a very positive way? I know you're, well, you're still helping them out. One of the big rewards for me was to see faculty that we chose very carefully who came step into the role as department chair and continue this same focus. The, the, uh, the, Major field test scores are still now what they were on average. So, yeah, I mean, but unless you're so massive that you can't afford to look individually with people who understand the program, it just pays to do it starting off with real information, real outcomes. and. Fortunately, the people who came into the department were chosen carefully continue to focus on that. May not stay that way forever, but it's so far so good. Okay. So choosing people turns out to be the most important thing any group does, in my judgment. A um, couple of things. One of them is uh, that an R of 81 corresponds to an R squared of about 0.65. So. Uh, uh, say again? R, R, an R of 0.81 corresponds right. to an R squared of about 0.65. It, it, so exactly. Not bad. No, uh, for human data, that's exceptional. Yeah. A uh, couple of uh, questions. Uh, one of them is you, you mentioned James Hayward partway through. Uh, is he the uh, editor of the book Creation Reconsidered? I think that. Uh, how recently published was it? Um, I have I've a nod over there. Uh, oh, it was what? It's got to be nineties, eighties, something. Okay, like that. yeah, he's the editor. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, another one I had. Uh, another question I had was uh, the uh, the interviewers or the interviewees. Mm -hmm who are giving all those data. Uh, did you include people who did not finish the biology major? No. OK. No. So uh, now it would be interesting to see what happened to the people who uh, chose not to continue, and, and if so, well, why? Uh, in, in the Andrews way of doing business, uh, those files that did not include students who finished biology would be almost inaccessible because of privacy and all that stuff. Um, although, if you're chairman, it seems like one could actually say, well, there's 53 people who started this year and uh, you know that one didn't make it, that one didn't make it, or went into something no, else. We, we did not. F I, one of the questions I thought might be asked that I couldn't answer is, of those who dropped out of the program, did they drop out of the university or did they simply switch? And we, couldn't, we can't shed light on that. Yeah. When we, I did look at that over more recent data, and probably 60% of the ones who dropped out of biology moved to another program. But in my data, switching programs and dropping the, co the whole college program is the same outcome. Okay, and um, can we go back to those grades again? And I wanted to ask a question and possibly make an observation depending on what the answer is. 
which grades are we talking about? The, the ones that start out with general biology, uh, first semester, general biology, oh, one, second okay. semester, and so forth. Okay. This is the one you're talking about, right? Um, well, if you plug it in, it'll be easier for everybody. Oh, <laughs> come on. You're supposed to be able to. <laughs> that, that is the one, though. Correct. Yeah. Uh, we'll try. Can you... OK, wait, let's, uh, Play. Let's, okay. Do, let's do this. Start, yeah, start from selected slide. Yeah. OK. OK, and then just uh, yep. scroll and it down just... or whatever you do. Yeah, there you go. OK. Now, as I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the people who are, let's say, C's, going up to a little above a B minus. But I thought I had heard that those were average grades. Is that correct? I'm not, what did you mean by average? Um, the last is that last is average. Is the all of those are actual the core, grades. The core GPA uh, is for the like the two point six two is uh -huh. for the thirty three students who got a C in foundations. Okay, the thirty three students who got a C then averaged, if I understand it, then a B minus in in number yep. two. Yes. In the in the overall average. So these are actual yeah. grades, not right. right. Not yes. averages. And, and the average, the only average we have is at the end. No, these are all averages at every step. Yeah, or well, average of the students, but, but uh, not average. Uh, in other words, um, I'm not this sure. isn't the GPA after FB2. This is an actual grade in FB2. Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. This, oh, OK, there's not a cumulative change in GPA through the graph, yeah. These, the the average at the end is the average grade for that cohort. Right. Okay. Um, no, that answers the question that I was <laughs> right. going to going to raise. But uh, uh, it's, now that what that suggests is the people who did a basically all did a the second round and then started drifting off. Uh, You're talking about the 90 A's at the top? Yeah. Well, stop to think what it would be like if you got an A in your first course and you couldn't get anything but an A from then on. Of course, if they're at the top at the beginning, it's going to be very hard to keep that in all the courses. Yeah. And th there were probably about 20% or 25% of those in the top of the 90 who stayed four point. Right. But then there's a significant number that must have dipped down into Bs. And oh, yes. Yes. If you look at the, the actual data, uh, yes, for sure. So one of the things that it looks like is happening is that uh, your top people are gradually sliding down a little bit. But your C's are winding up at uh, 2.6. Yes. And imagine then, since these are averages for the average up to 2.6, there must be at least 30% of them who end up in the three range. Right. And, and, and these are the ones we would look at as experiencing this transformation of success. Right. It seems to me that you might have two important drivers of this educational transformation and the overall success for all your students. Uh, one, I think, is the, the biomedical major and the, mm, if you will, the very focused, long-term focus, career focus of pre-med students. Absolutely. Okay? And, you know, when I was at the University of South Florida, for instance, we called them throats, okay? Uh, they I were, won't ask you what the prefix yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, the other, I think, is the fact that you had 
this master's program and you had in essence uh, more than students with more than four years uh, in the major with a real focus and ultimately the master's degree is sort of a stepping stone yeah. it, it doesn't have much yeah. commercial value in and of itself uh, 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 that's well, I, I would say no, there's a it doesn't there. meet the reasons, it doesn't in itself meet the reasons why the students went into the master's program. Okay. Uh, so I, I think, to me, there, th those were also within the student body drivers for success, not just the program itself, although I, I, I want to say that the program structure had to have been contributory. I'm adding additional factors. Uh, I'm proposing that. Jeff. Well, uh, I don't know how you, you, you assess that. You, it, it would be very hard to assess. But yeah. let me uh, let me say in our lab. Uh, now, when we say our, I worked with Gordon At Atkins, and we di did this together for years and years. When an undergraduate chose to do research in our group, there were typically two or three graduate students also active who not only gave them guidance and idea of where this, this particular team was going, but gave them positive examples of what you can do. Because frankly, many of our master students were in it to achieve something they hadn't already achieved. Like I had, I think, 15 of the 30-some entered med school following the master's degree. Then they hadn't been successful beforehand. We're thrilled with that outcome. I, I want to maybe suggest another driver here. Yeah. And that is biology, while having a general mainstream biology has a general, general uh, philosophic premise. Yes. Okay. It is a combination of evolution and genetics. The fact is, uh, and you had a philosophic premise, but it, I don't detect that it was uh, hardcore, hard-edged. I don't know what you mean. Uh, there was an emphasis, but not a requirement for a rigid interpretation of science. Oh, you're, that, you're saying we didn't, we didn't uh, we didn't quiz the students at the end to see if, yeah, if they are holding the party truth. Oh, absolutely not. So here's my this point. This would have destroyed our purpose because yes. we here's wanted them to go out the door believing with their faith intact, which most did. But if we didn't accomplish that, these kids are still individuals. So the, the high analytic thinking component of the, I think it was called the MST or, or MTS, I, uh, uh, MFT, major okay, field fixed. Uh, that, I think the, the thing about science and biology is it's open ended enough for critical thinking to take place if it's cultivated and um, not stifled philosophically. So it becomes, the major becomes a, a magnet for minds that want to engage critically with information. I would only say, hopefully, I would agree yeah. with you. Okay. We'd love to see that outcome. And in fact, you, you did see it many times, but we were happiest when, and I, I had, for about 10 years, I taught a capstone seminar which focused on origins. And during that period, I was very, very well up to date on where our students were. Uh, that ended uh, after I became dean of research, and the number of majors went to the point where we could no, do, no longer do it as a group interaction. We ended up repeating stuff they'd already been through in Tom Goodwin's very, very good course on origins. So I, 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 had, I had a very good look for quite a while. And I was pleased, on average, with the fact that the students were well informed, they understood the problems with origins, but I knew enough of where they were that they left with their faith 
intact in a divine creation. Now, as I said, we didn't try to put rigid dates on it, but we did, starting with design, that's very, very easy. I mean, focusing on design, it's very, very easy to generate positive thinking and interaction in the area. Does that answer? No. Yeah. I think it opens the door for a lot more discussion. But, I, I but that's, that, that's the whole point. Yes, yeah. You don't want them going out the door mimicking. You want them to go out the door saying, this is my position that I've thought through. Well, uh, oh, should I say thank you for yeah. your interest? I, I think we should say thank you, thank you, you for your too. presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You let me talk about something I really enjoy. I mean, student success is one of my three major focuses. The first is teaching, the second is my neuro research, and the third is this. Not necessarily in the order of importance.